to the uh, 14th Burntwood Lecture, um, which is an opportunity for our distinguished speaker tonight, Baroness Parmenter, to talk about the uh, uh, important mental issues arising from Brexit. The, the, uh, the, 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 the IES uh, did a membership survey uh, prior to the Brexit vote. And 68% of our, our members indicated support for staying in the European Union, and only 4% uh, supported leave. The, around about the same time, prior to the referendum, there was also a separate survey of environmental professionals by the Society for Environment and the ENDS report. And, and they found, again, a very large majority, about 77%, uh, intending to vote to remain in the European Union. So I think it's pretty safe to say that of the 48% of the whole national population that voted to stay in the European Union, a very significant proportion of those were environmental scientists of one form or another. So the Brexit result came, it did to me, as a hell of a shock. A, a really, really major shock. Um, and the IES has been, one of the roles of IES has been to act as a sort of support group for people suffering from EU anxiety, separation anxiety, hence the name of the lecture. Um, and uh, these are actually quite dangerous times uh, for, regu for regulation. The focus on will we be part of the, uh, uh, the single market or will we not be part of the single market, that decision will have quite fundamental impact on the nature of environmental regulation, laws and protection in this country. Within the single market, there are all kinds of things we will have to do to stay in. Outside the single market, uh, we could there are sufficient people in government at the moment who are anti-regulation to start unpicking the whole fabric of environmental regulation in this country. And I find that really scary. For example, the, the nature directives, the habitat directives, the bird directives and so on, will cease to, the directives will cease to have effect if we, if we, when we leave. At the moment, those are translated into UK law, uh, and therefore the laws will remain. But if you can translate something into UK law and you're against regulation, you can untranslate it. And that's the worry. IES is at the forefront of, trying, of being determined to pre present the case for better environmental regulation, to maintain the regulations we've got, and to improve. And that's one of the great things uh, that this organization is doing. It's already given evidence to the House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee uh, on the challenges and opportunities that Brexit presents for the environment, and to the Science and Technology Select Committee on the implications of Brexit for UK science. So your society is being very, my, my, our society is being very active in that front. And despite those undoubted risks, and they're real, and they're, that, that, that they are, to my mind, deeply worrying, leaving the EU actually also presents us with opportunities uh, to improve environmental protection laws, regulations in this country. Um, and uh, we've been working with colleagues in other environmental professional bodies and learned as societies to highlight opportunities to the government for environmental protection post-Brexit. Uh, uh, for, for example, at the moment, if you're a landowner, a land manager, a farmer, you get subsidised uh, for doing environmental, uh, nice kind of environmental things. That's a daft thing to call it. We should be paying landowners, land managers and farmers to deliver the ecosystem services from the environment that society wants and they should be paid properly to do that. They're not subsidies, they're payments to, for the land managers to deliver the kind of things that society wants, like effective natural environmental flood control, for example. So 
IS is working really hard to try and get that kind of message across along with other environmental organisations. <clears throat> So that's the sort of area I imagine that tonight's speaker is going to cover, but I may be wrong, we'll, we'll wait and see. Um, but over the last few years, we've had a whole range of extremely, uh, been very lucky with a whole range of, of me, distinguished speakers. Uh, Bob Watson, for example, Jonathan Porritt, Paul Eakins, uh, and Julia Slingle, to name just but, but a few. But after a long run of uh, scientists and economists, the lecture is returning to its roots tonight by inviting a working politician to give the lecture. And that working politician is Baroness Parminter, who's championed a whole range of environmental causes in her parliamentary career and, her previous, and in her previous life as chief executive of the conservation charity, the Campaign to Protect Rural England, CPRE which she's just reminding me is when I last met her, which is quite a long time ago now. Um, and uh, other various roles, for example, in the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, in which she was instrumental and in one of the people who managed to get fox hunting banned. Um, and also, I'm told, attack the tax on plastic bags. What's that got to do with cruelty? I'm not quite sure, but... Quite a lot. Quite a lot, okay. Maybe little animals get tied up in the bags, is that right? Okay, right. <laughs> anyway, so um, she once told uh, Radio 4 that the House of Lords is about getting things done rather than shouting at people. And that's an approach, surely, that is sorely needed in post-Brexit Britain. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Baroness Parminter. <laughs> Well, thank you for that very warm introduction, um, John. It's, uh, it's certainly an honour to have been asked to present the Burntwood Lecture uh, this year and to follow in the footsteps, as he rightly says, of such an illustrious uh, number of former speakers. Um, I'm definitely not a scientist. The, the furthest I got was O-level biology. Uh, but as he rightly said, I have been a campaigner, but I stand here unapologetically tonight uh, as a politician. And that's in not inappropriate. Lord Burntwood, as we know, was a member of parliament and a minister in Clement Attlee's Labour government. But more importantly, it's not inappropriate because the great challenge of our time and the subject on which I've been asked to speak tonight is essentially political, that of Brexit. How the UK manages its withdrawal from the European Union will shape this country's future for decades. In the absence of any clarity from the government, over what it sees as the final destination of this process, I hope I can enlist everyone here in helping me to draw up the broad approach that the UK should adopt in dealing with environmental policy post-Brexit. I'm going to tell you what I think, and then at the end I'll hope you'll respond with thoughts of your own. There are two competing visions for the future of the UK outside the EU. One hinted at by some of the supporters of the Leave side during the referendum, but never fully articulated, is of a country free of the kind of burdensome regulations they like to pretend emanated from Brussels. A fleet-footed, buccaneering, free-trading nation spotting openings in the global marketplace and exploiting them ruthlessly. This vision implies a deregulated, low-cost, low-tax, low-value economy with clear implications for environmental policy. In May this year, for example, George Eustace, the farming minister, attacked, and I quote, the spirit-crushing EU directives, including explicitly the birds and habitats directives, and went on to criticize the use of the precautionary principle as the basis of EU legislation, a criticism echoed by many of his colleagues. You may remember that this kind of approach echoes Conservative ministers' attempts during the coalition government to water down or scrap environmental regulations through such initiatives as the Red Tape Challenge and the Balance of Competences Review, attempts which happily Liberal Democrat ministers ensured came to naught. This deregulatory approach to Britain's economy outside the EU is doomed to fail because the UK will never be able to compete at the bottom of the market with poorer countries in Eastern Europe or Asia or Africa with lower levels of regulation and cheaper labour costs 
And those countries will, in any case, find it increasingly more difficult to compete on this basis as automation gradually replaces low-skilled jobs. But any attempt to pursue this goal could do significant damage to Britain's natural environment and to the reputation of British products. Remember that it wasn't all that long ago, 1970s, 1980s, that Britain was known as the dirty man of Europe, with good reason, given its record on issues such as acid rain or bathing water quality. And you only need to look at the current government's attempts to water down the EU's approach to the regulation of neonicotinoids or to air pollution or to avoid implementing the ambient air quality directive to realise that the threat of environmental standards falling after Brexit is a very real one. The other vision for Britain's future is the polar opposite. A country committed to the highest environmental standards on its, for its air, its water and its countryside because it recognises that these are the key determinants of the citizen's quality of life, essential natural assets that underpin its society and economy. This vision is of a country committed to the highest environmental standards for its industries and for the products and the services it makes and sells to the world, because it understands that the global markets now opening up around us are demanding low carbon and resource efficient products and services. This vision is of a country open to the world outside, fully engaged and participating in international environmental initiatives and regimes, including in particular those on the governance of shared resources such as the seas and the atmosphere. This vision is clearly the most desirable option, not just for its innate qualities, but for the UK's ability to compete and prosper in the future. Now, you might argue that the best way to achieve that particular vision is for Britain to remain a member of the EU. And I wouldn't disagree. But we lost that argument, and now we have to face the consequences. And that includes tackling the reasons why 52% of those who voted chose to leave the EU. I doubt that almost any of them had environmental policy in mind when they voted to leave, but they nevertheless rejected the UK's current social and economic model because it failed to deliver the kind of life they wanted. So the framework of law and policy outside the EU that we have to construct to deliver environmental outcomes needs to play its role in addressing that disenchantment, and I'll come back to that later. I expect everyone in this room would share with me the desire for that second kind of vision. And I suspect you will also share with me the belief that the existing EU legislation and policy setup for the protection of the natural environment is one of the best, probably the best, of such frameworks anywhere in the world. Not in every single respect, but certainly overall. It follows then that our aim for UK environmental policy post-Brexit should be to adopt or mirror as much EU legislation as possible and also to improve on it where possible. I will consider this in the rest of my lecture under four headings. Firstly, incorporating EU legislation into UK law. Secondly, establishing systems for compliance and enforcement. Thirdly, joining EU frameworks. And finally, improving on EU policies. First, as many environmental regulations, policies and strategies as possible should be incorporated wholesale into UK regulations, policies and strategies. As I have just argued, this is important not just to maintain existing standards of environmental protection, but also so that British products can be sold into European markets, the destination for almost half of the UK's exports. To do this, British products will of course need to comply with EU product standards on vehicle fuel efficiency, appliance energy efficiency, chemical contents, safety standards, the list goes on and on. Clearly, if the UK is to retain full access to the European single market, common product standards will be a requirement. But even if we do not, the EU will in any case remain Britain's largest export market by far. And it is inconceivable that we should wish to abandon standards which enable our exporters to trade with our nearest neighbours. And in any case, whatever Brexiteers may claim, there is no universal clamour from industry to water down environmental standards. British companies and their products 
want to make sure that there are no different standards, make sure that the markets they're destined for have common standards. They want to create single types of products that they can export to any number of markets. Companies want the certainty that standards will remain high, which will enable them to schedule their future investments and plan their future strategies in the knowledge that the goalposts will not be shifting. And on top of that, we will need to adhere to many EU standards to achieve our own domestic policy goals. For example, as the Committee on Climate Change pointed out in October, the new EU vehicle fuel efficiency standards expected to be in place after 2020 will be a key instrument in cutting UK carbon emissions, covering around a quarter of the reductions required across the economy by 2030. If the UK has weaker standards than the EU, it will reduce opportunities for UK manufacturers and lead to inefficient products with higher running costs and emissions being dumped on the UK market. So let me be clear, high regulatory standards should not be considered as burdensome red tape, but a requirement that is essential to meet climate change and environmental policy goals, whilst at the same time creating a level playing field for our businesses to trade and grow. We will need to shout that message loud and clear, given the government's repeated undermining of the case for regulation, as the process of incorporating EU legislation gets underway. This incorporation of EU legislation is, of course, the aim of the government's rather counterintuitively named Great Repeal Bill. Given that an estimated 25% of all EU legislation deals with environmental protection, this will be an enormous task. I was tempted to say a titanic task, but the Foreign Secretary has already made that adjective uniquely his own in the context of Brexit. The process poses a number of challenges. To illustrate them, I'll choose what is probably the largest and most complex piece of EU environmental legislation, the Registration, Evaluation, Authorisation and Restriction of Chemicals Regulation, or REACH, as we all prefer to know it. REACH requires companies to collect information on the properties and uses of the chemicals they manufacture or import and register them with the European Chemicals Agency in Helsinki. This is a dynamic area of law with new substances regularly becoming subject to authorisation or restriction. The agency is staffed with experts with a range of backgrounds from all around the EU. Companies based outside the EU cannot participate directly in all aspects of REACH, facing the UK with the choice of reaching some kind of cooperation agreement with the European Chemicals Agency or of establishing its own regulatory body at significant cost replicating the extensive expertise present in its European counterpart. We have to know which option the government intends to pursue before we can meaningfully debate the Great Repeal Bill. We could, of course, choose to abandon REACH, but that would mean that our consumers would lose a rigorous, if complicated, framework for the protection of their own health and safety. And chemicals from the UK exported to the EU would still have to be registered, this time by the importer, and unscrupulous manufacturers in the EU might be tempted to dump products that fail to meet EU standards on our market. Multiply that set of issues by the number of regulations to be covered by the bill, many of which contain roles for EU institutions, and you begin to see why many observers regard the two-year timetable for completing the Article 50 process as pure fantasy, at least if it begins as early as March next year. And the estimates of the direct cost of Brexit produced by the Chancellor in his autumn statement last month as highly optimistic. The second problem is whether the government will take the opportunity of the Great Repeal Bill to lower environmental standards. Ministers have assured us they won't, but I'm not reassured by performances such as those of Environment Minister Therese Coffey and, Minister, as Minister, and the Minister for exiting the European Union, Robin Walker, at the House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee in September. They were asked seven times if the government would retain EU air quality limits following Brexit. Neither made that commitment. Remember that this comes against a long history of UK governments opposing air quality standards. For example, during the recent review of the Ambient Air Quality Directive, the government was quite open about its desire to lower standards for nitrogen dioxide to avoid infraction proceedings. And of course, everyone will know that thanks to the courage and persistence of the lawyers at Client Earth, the government has finally been forced to comply with the directive 
and produce a strategy by July next year. This record gives me no confidence at all that air quality standards will be maintained through the Great Repeal Bill. In this context, I note that the Government have only committed to incorporating EU regulations into UK law, and I quote, and it was the Prime Minister himself who said this, wherever practical. Clearly by itself, that's not unreasonable. Practicality is an important test, and many EU regulations will not be able to be incorporated exactly as they are. But while it may be necessary, it will not be sufficient. And I believe we should be calling on the government to add a second requirement that any adjustments to EU environmental laws needed to fit the realities of post-Brexit UK must provide the same or a higher level of environmental protection as those in the original regulations. The third problem with the process of transposing EU law into UK legislation is what happens after the Great Repeal Bill becomes law. Will EU regulations, once transposed into UK law, be treated as primary or secondary legislation? Secondary legislation or statutory instruments can be changed relatively easily by ministers, with far less parliamentary scrutiny than is afforded primarily in, uh, uh, in primary legislation. In incorporating EU environmental legislation, will the Great Repeal Bill simply create a whole new range of statutory instruments which the government will subsequently be able to amend with limited parliamentary debate, or will it create new primary legislation which will afford greater status to the laws in question and be debated and scrutinised when amended in far more detail? Clearly, our preference should be for the latter. The fourth problem is that of keeping pace with EU legislative change. Once the Article 50 process is underway, it can be assumed that any new EU regulations agreed will not be implemented in the UK. But we know already of several coming down the track in 2018 or 2019. For example, regulations governing the recycling and recovery of waste, which are important not just for domestic purposes, but because the UK is a major exporter of waste for treatment elsewhere in the EU. It will be important for the government to keep up with the pace of change and ensure that the Great Repeal Bill incorporates EU law not only as, as it is when the process started, but as it is when it finishes. The fifth problem is the role of the European Court of Justice. Clearly, the Great Repeal Bill will include the provision that the ECJ is no longer something that has jurisdiction over the EU and the UK. But ECJ case law has been important in many cases determined in UK courts, and a decision simply not to recognise ECJ jurisprudence will have major impacts on the interpretation of UK law. ECJ case law should be incorporated into the UK's court system. And the final problem, at least for this section of my lecture, is the impact of the removal of the overall framework provided by EU policy, such as, for example, successes, successive environmental action plans or the Birds and Habitats Directive. As I'm sure you're aware, Unlike EU regulations, which take effect through the EU without the need for implementing legislation, and which the Great Repeal Bill will therefore need to transpose into UK law, directives generally set minimum standards, which member states may choose to exceed and are transposed through domestic law. So in one sense, EU directives are already fully embedded in UK law, but leaving the EU will divorce these British laws from their parent European frameworks, which are generally dynamic regimes which continue to evolve and to develop. And we will lose contact with overarching strategies such as the seventh environmental action plan or the circular economy package. The government must make it a priority to set out clear strategic frameworks to replace those we will lose through Brexit. On the climate change side, of course, we already have the 2008 Climate Change Act. But we also know that the current government policies are on track to deliver at best only a half of the reductions in greenhouse gas emissions required to meet the targets of the fifth carbon budget. So the content of the government's industrial strategy, and more particularly of whatever document they publish next year to replace the coalition government's 2011 carbon plan, will be hugely important. In this context, I'm encouraged by the government's ratification of the Paris Agreement last month, but its decision to adopt the fifth carbon budget as well, as recommended by the Committee on Climate Change, and by its clear commitment displayed by BEIS and DEFRA ministers so far. 
I am less encouraged when looking at the rest of government. For example, I found it simply astonishing that in his statement on Heathrow in October, the Secretary of State for Transport made no mention, no mention at all, of the probable impacts on climate change. I'm also less encouraged by the absence from the National Infrastructure Plan of any commitment to explicit decarbonisation, though I really shouldn't be surprised. The government this year earlier refused an amendment I proposed to the Housing and Planning Act, which would have reinstated the zero carbon home standards for all future house building. The reason DCLG gave for not accepting this was that such an approach would increase costs for house builders. The government must accept that the task of meeting climate targets needs to be met by all government departments and agencies working together. It cannot be something that's left to BEIS and DEFRA and forgotten about, or frankly actively opposed by everybody else. On the protection of the natural environment, we need an equivalent structure to the, that provided by the Climate Change Act, a new long-term strategy for the protection of habitats, land, water and air, including hard targets and duties underpinned by legislation and overseen by a statutory body, most obviously the Natural Capital Committee, which should be made permanent. Again, I am encouraged by the government's intention to produce a 25-year plan for the natural environment. It remains to be seen how effective this will be. If it does not set ambitious targets for the UK's stock of natural capital and biodiversity, it will be judged a failure. If it does not place a duty on all government departments and public bodies to implement it, it will be judged a failure. And if it is not underpinned by legislation, with a body to help deliver progressively and hold the government to account, it will be judged a failure. Alongside both these pillars of environmental policy, we need a clear commitment and a strategy to the circular economy to reduce the consumption of natural resources and the production of waste that characterises our current economic model. My party fought the last election on the promise to pass a Resource Efficiency and Zero Waste Act, which would, among other things, task the Natural Capital Kitty Committee with producing a report on how to reduce resource use, identifying resources being used unsustainably and recommending legally binding targets for reducing the net consumption. The EU circular economy package is a good start in this area and we need to see this kind of approach given a much higher profile in UK policy post-Brexit. That's quite enough though of the challenges of the Great Repeal Bill and its aftermath. And I turn now to my second area for action, the need to establish robust systems for compliance and enforcement. For it is not enough simply to have good regulations and law, as we all know these have to be effectively enforced. The problem with Brexit, therefore, is obvious. We will lose the compliance framework by the European Commission and the European Court of Justice. In the context of UK policy, this has proved its worth time and time again. We know, for example, that the recycling targets finally adopted by the UK government were driven by the threat of infraction and the sums of money that the UK government were going to have to pay were at the heart of that process. <coughs> And as Alan Andrews of Client Earth stated in evidence to a House of Lords committee last month, and I quote, during the course of this last round of litigation against the government, it was revealed that the main driver behind their new air quality plan was not the Supreme Court order from the UK in 2015, but the threat of being infracted by the Commission. They aimed to comply based on what they thought the Commission might move to issuing fines. About 30 environmental cases brought by the Commission against the UK have resulted in judgments against the government. What replaces this? If the UK joins the European Free Trade Association, which is one option which retains access to the single market, there is an EFTA court which operates something like the ECJ, but without any power to issue fines, so its impact is clearly limited. Andrea Ledson, the Secretary of State for the Environment, has asserted that UK courts will be able to deal with any matters concerning the enforcement of environmental legislation, and clearly this will be important. But as the quote from Client Earth shows, it was the fines threatened by the European Commission, rather than the judicial review through the Supreme Court, that acted as the main driver of government action over air quality. And in any case, who's going to initiate these actions through the court? Therese Coffrey has suggested that this will be individuals and organisations, perhaps like Client Earth. 
But this can be an enormously costly process, as I know from my time as Chief Executive of CPRE. And the likelihood of this happening, if left up to NGOs to initiate, will be far less than the situation pre-Brexit, with the European Commission systematically monitoring and taking action against non-complying member states. There are a number of steps we can take to improve enforcement and compliance. First, as I argued earlier, we should transfer ECJ case law over into the UK system so that it benefits from the decisions we have guaranteed individuals' rights to enforce, hold government to account, access information and so on. Secondly, we should fully implement the provisions of the Our House Convention on access to information, public participation and decision making and access to justice in environmental matters. Currently, this is implemented through EU legislation. We need it transposed into UK law, perhaps through an Environmental Rights Act. Third, we need effective enforcement agencies armed not just with powers of inspection, but also powers to issue fines and penalties. Bodies such as the Environment Agency and Health and Safety Executive do a good job with very limited resources, but at present their powers are far too limited. Above the level of day-to-day -day enforcement of laws and regulations, we need a body which scrutinises government actions against environmental targets. Personally, I think there is a strong argument for an Office of Environmental Responsibility, modelled on the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility, to work with government departments to help them draw up business plans and scrutinise sustainable development strategies, to scrutinise and query department, departmental key actions and activities, to undertake independent analysis of the government's environmental performance, and to assess and advise governments on the impact of significant new and existing policies. As I argued earlier, environmental objectives need to be embedded across government, and this is one mechanism which could help to achieve that. Now let me turn to my third main area, the desirability of joining where possible relevant EU frameworks and organisations. Self-evidently, the UK's decision to leave the EU does not mean that it can stop cooperating with other nations in the management of shared resources, in tackling transboundary pollution and in regulating cross-border trade. This applies in a number of fairly obvious uh, issues. Let's start with the common fisheries policy, which of course will cease to apply after Brexit. Although the CFP has a poor history, recent reforms have started to deliver more sustainable fisheries, incorporating the principle of maximum sustainable yields and banning discards. The complexity of the transition to any new arrangement post-Brexit will be huge, and there's a real risk to fish stocks if negotiations are prolonged. Without a new deal, stocks could be fished out in EU waters before they reach our own. Furthermore, since 80% of the British catch is exported, any attempt to increase the UK catch outside the CFP could well lead to exports markets being closed against us. To the maximum extent possible, the UK should continue to be associated with and undertake the responsibilities of the CFP in reducing the environmental burden of industrial scale fishing. Like fish, pollution knows no boundaries and no borders. 50% of the air pollution experienced in the UK originates from abroad and a fair proportion of the pollution we generate affects our neighbours. This is an international framework which is covered outside the EU, the Gothenburg Protocol to the Convention on Long-Range Transboundary Air Pollution. But this deals primarily with information sharing and the exchange of scientific information. Effective controls on air pollution come through EU directives, such as that on ambient air quality, industrial emissions and national emission ceilings. Recently revised, the NEC directive not only set emission ceilings for sulphur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, volatile organic compounds and ammonia, but also establishes a clean air forum to allow for the sharing of best practice and scientific information. Rather than trying to set up new structures, we should continue after Brexit to engage fully in these institutions and frameworks, if that should prove possible. Turning to climate change, the major question is the UK's continued participation in the EU's emission trading scheme, the world's largest emissions trading system. If the UK remains part of the single market, it would be possible to remain part of the ETS too, though without voting rights, the position that Norway uh, finds itself in now. If the UK doesn't retain access to the single market, I would argue, nevertheless, for it to remain part of the ETS. About a third of the UK's annual greenhouse gas emissions are currently covered by the ETS, 
and UK companies are responsible for about 11% of total emissions within the ETS. That enables British companies to sell and buy permits with other companies in the EU, which, since there are cheaper options for reducing emissions in several other EU member states compared to the UK, allows for more cost-effective reductions in emissions and lower costs to industries. I certainly accept that thanks to the over-allocation of permits, the ETS is far less effective than it should be and needs reform. But the basic concept is sound, and the UK should not abandon it. On energy policy, increasing interconnectivity with continental Europe clearly makes much more sense as UK electricity generation becomes increasingly to depend on wind and solar PV. On cloudy, windless days, the more we can import from Europe, the less we will need expensive backup diesel generators. And on sunny, windy days, the more we will be able to export to other countries too. In any Brexit scenario, cooperation with the EU internal energy market will be essential. Again, if it should prove possible, the UK should remain a member of the EU Energy Union. Similarly, we should mirror or improve on the targets included in the EU's 2030 Climate and Energy Package. Investors in low-carbon energy badly need to be reassured of the UK's commitment to decarbonisation and renewable energy. One of the most depressing features, I think, of the aftermath of the referendum is the way in which European scientific researchers have already started to disassociate themselves from their UK colleagues in cases where it might jeopardise their ability to access EU research funding, which often requires cross-border cooperation. Some of you will know this much better than I. Even if it is not possible to negotiate continued access to research funding and contributions to it, of course, it would be worthwhile trying to negotiate some kind of arrangement where this collaboration could continue, even if the British component is funded separately. I do not know whether this will be possible, but I do know that some non-EU states, including Israel and Switzerland, currently participate in the EU research programmes such as Horizon 2020. This is not just about money. More importantly, perhaps, it's about retaining the spirit of cooperation and the culture of open collaboration in our efforts to tackle global challenges. Now I want to be more optimistic, turning in the final section of my lecture to the opportunities Brexit gives to the environmental policy, because EU policies, of course, are not perfect. You won't find it hard to guess the main topic under this heading, the common agricultural policy. Like the CFP, the CAP has not had a good record it has created excessive pressures for the environment from its support for agricultural production and input use. But also, like the CFP, its recent reforms have improved it somewhat, and it can also claim credit for helping to maintain more traditional low-input and high-nature welfare value farms. Payments for environmental management on farmland have grown sharply. Nonetheless, considerable distance remains between the present model and a truly green agriculture, and there are major concerns about the current greening provisions. The UK's departure presents a major opportunity, as John has mentioned, for the government to reshape the country's land management and agricultural policy. I believe that future policy and the financial support allied to it must focus on rewarding farmers for the public goods that they provide, producing healthy food and protecting the natural capital of farm landscapes through building healthy soils, carbon storage, clean water and flood prevention. There is no doubt that there will be political pressure to divert the £3 billion per annum that our farmers currently receive away from agriculture. Who can forget the Brexit bus and its infamous promise of £350 million a week for the NHS? By allying a new agricultural and land management policy to the provision of public goods, political will to maintain farm support, which is critical to many farm businesses, particularly in environmentally sensitive areas, could be secured. Making the case for public support to improve our health, providing safe food, access to the countryside, and building up the natural resources like water that we all rely on. The consultation the government has promised in the next few months on its food and farming policy must dovetail with the government's proposed 25-year environment plan. And an independent commission should be set up to consider views of all stakeholders, including the public, and then to provide recommendations to the government a commission would be able to consider the competing demands in the national interest, 
and make good on the reality that DEFRA just doesn't have sufficient resources to undertake this pivotal task alone. Alongside the creation of a new land management and agricultural policy for the UK, or more accurately for its component nations, there will be other opportunities from Brexit. The removal of EU state aid requirements could allow us to simplify the UK policy mix on climate change, particularly fiscal policy. The combination of the ETS, the carbon price floor, the climate change levy and the various levied, levies added to electricity bills to fund the government's policy objectives and the mixtures of exemptions and partial exemptions for particular industrial sectors have led to a confusing and very uneven mix of pricing with some perverse outcomes. For example, due to the implicit carbon price arising from all those instruments, electricity is in effect more expensive than gas which is ridiculous given the place of decarbonisation and the pace of that in the power generation sector. I might also add the need to scrap the government's ludicrous decision last year to end the exemption of renewable sources of energy from the climate change levy, which, as Friends of the Earth rightly put it, was rather like applying alcohol duties to apple juice. Similarly, in the area of tax policy, Brexit could remove the pressure on the UK from the European Commission to end its lower rate of VAT for energy-saving equipment. In the area of policy on heat, the EU is currently focused far too much on renewable heat, which has the effect, among others, of artificially boosting the use of biomass, which can be low carbon, but is not automatically so. If the focus was instead on low carbon heat, it should open up other options, such as the use of waste heat or hydrogen. And I'm sure there are other areas too where we can improve on some EU policies which affect the environment. So there are a few crumbs of comfort to be garnered from Brexit. But in most respects, as I have argued, the best outcome for UK environmental policy will be to follow and adopt EU laws and standards where we can, join EU frameworks and institutions where possible, together with establishing robust systems for enforcement and compliance, and creating our own UK policy framework centred on targeting climate change, protecting nature in all its forms, and reducing the use and wastage of natural resources, all implemented by a government structure in which environmental policy is mainstreamed through all departments and agencies, rather than being left to BIS and DEFRA and a few others to manage. I hope you agree with my proposals, in principle if not in detail, and I look forward to hearing your response. But I want to make one last point before I finish. It should be clear that achieving this aim, this vision of a government and a society and an economy fully committed to environmental goals, will require an immense amount of persuasion. There will be many voices in favour of the first vision I set out, of a deregulated cheap labour economy which devalues nature and despoils the environment, though of course they wouldn't describe it in that way. And they need countering with argument and facts and passion. In many ways, the environmental movement in the UK, by which I include all of us who care about the natural environment, have had it relatively easy in recent years. The EU framework has been mostly a good one, and most of the argument and lobbying has taken place at a fairly technocratic level, and mostly in Brussels, far away from public view. It was too easy during the referendum for the Leave campaigners to paint all regulations emanating from Brussels as absurdly bureaucratic or costly, or somehow un-British. At the same time, the Remain campaign almost entirely failed to paint a positive picture of the EU, despite the fact that a substantial majority of people agree with the principle that countries need to cooperate in tackling environmental problems. We won't be able to rely, after Brexit, on the EU winning our battles for us. We will have to fight for every piece of environmental legislation and demonstrate why it matters not just for middle-class liberals like myself, and probably most of you, but for ordinary men and women, for the 52% as well as the 48%. We need to show how an ambitious climate policy is good for jobs and growth and prosperity across the country, through new renewable energy industries and electric car plants and home insulation, through stewardship of the land through the revival of areas devastated by the end of traditional industries where there are no jobs and no hope. We need to show why protecting nature is good for people's health and the economy. We need to show why cutting waste and sharing resources make people's lives better.
I and my colleagues in Parliament will try to do all that, but we need your help. Scientists and practitioners like yourselves who have a crucial role to play alongside businesses and campaigning NGOs and community groups and individual citizens. We need to take environmental arguments out of the technocratic closet and make them popular. We need to make sure that the government, any government, can't ignore the public desire for a better environment and a better life. And we need to win these arguments for our children and our country's future. Thank you. Okay, that was absolutely masterful. Thank you. I wish you were Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Thank you. Karen Roberts. Um, I'm a council member of the IES and an environmental consultant. Um, I thought that was a, I agree with John, I thought that was an excellent um, summary of some of the issues. Um, I, uh, in my career, have been at uh, various times an environmental scientist, and one of the things that is most deeply troubling to me is the separation of the British scientific community from the European scientific community and the environmental scientific community in particular. Many of our scientific research projects are pan-European and need to be so because our challenges are pan-European. But beyond that, the investigations into things like um, environmental technologies are also pan-European. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how you think we should approach that as a scientific, scientifically focused institution. What can we do to try and ensure that those collaborations continue into the future? Well, it's a really big issue, which hasn't had as much coverage in the Brexit debate as some of the other issues, particularly since a number of the challenges we face, not just around climate change, but for example, food security, are global challenges. And we in the UK have a lot of expertise built up over 40 years. And it was very interesting. We had a debate in the House of Lords a couple of weeks back, and I spoke to a couple of um, the researchers in the food security sector. And they were saying when, uh, back 40 years ago, there was the start of talking of cooperation with European partners, everyone thought this was a complete waste of time. Now the links have been built up, um, and it's not just about funding, it's about shared trust and relationships, uh, and all that is at risk of being lost. And my sense at the moment is, although there is some lobbying being done of the government to make them aware of the case, um, it, the, the voices are not strong enough and that we need to be lobbying ministers, not just in traditional areas, but right across government, to ensure that the, uh, the, the voice of scientists is, is heard. Because at the moment, they have, they have no concept on... I mean, the gov DEFRA talks a good case around food security. But when you start talking about, well, you know, hold on, we are doing... We are, the progress in this area has been up until now on a pan-European basis. If, it's, you know, if the funding and the collaboration stops, you know, we, we're going to seriously diminish our ability to feed our own nation, let alone the rest of the world. They're not, I don't think, actually really getting those messages strongly enough. So I think there's a, a very strong case for organisations such as the IES and others to be making the case across government on that issue. The front here, the microphone, please. N not quite the front. This, this, this lady. Put your hand up. There you are. Thank you. Name and affiliation. I'm a Siri. I'm a member. Um, I work in the sustainability. I work on sustainability in particular in the construction industry. And one of the things that is very apparent to me is that as an industry body, we are self-sabotaging because we have a bunch of environmental professionals that rely very heavily on the complexity behind the environmental legislation and how it's been implemented to ensure that they have continual employment. And we have a bunch of environmental professionals that would want to reform it to make it easier so as to ensure that there is continued environmental improvement and we have lots of change. So how do we, as an industry, unite to ensure that the bigger issues of climate change that you, you, and some of the other things like air pollution that you were talking about are then actually not sabotaged by other environmental professionals? 
Well, I think there's almost, that's a very interesting issue, and, but there's also, a, there's also a supplementary question to that, which is uh, how does the voice of uh, the construction industry, which is interested in a sustainable future, get heard properly as well? Because it is not uh, lobbying uh, in a very dynamic and effective way. And all, the, what, all we certainly see in Parliament is that the voice of things like the House Builders Federation and various other um, industries have a very powerful lobby. And although there are very good people in the construction industry who are interested in ensuring that there's a level playing field and recognise that regulation is, is good for the industry if it meets policy goals as well as building the homes we need, that voice is not getting heard. And one of the things, I mean, at the end of the, of the lecture, I said, I think, you know, I think there are challenges for us. We as, an industry, we as a, a group of organisations who want to get the environmental message across, we have to start looking to find new ways of working, new umbrella groups, new frameworks to actually get, get our voices heard, because if we don't, we are just going to be sunk. Gentleman there, and then I'm going to go over here. Uh, my name is Stephen Martin. Uh, uh, my affiliation is University of Worcester and the University of West of England. I have another anxiety, as well as the separation anxiety, and it's called the contagion anxiety, which is being promoted by a certain former minister, Mr. Gove, that seems to me to be separation. And when we, in the environment context, pan-European issues are so important, and you've stressed collaboration and cooperation, but if the Brits do exit in a hard exit, what is the, and the anxiety is, what is the implication for the rest of Europe? And how do you feel about that? Well, of course, we, we can't answer that until we know what hard, whether we, A, whether we have a soft Brexit or a hard Brexit, and what soft Brexit and hard Brexit means to the government, because they won't tell us. Um, uh, uh, and it's been very interesting uh, going across the road on a regular basis yesterday and the day before, seeing what's going on in the Supreme Court at the moment, because it's absolutely, I feel passionately that Parliament has a fundamental role in assessing the plans that the government has, and we need to do that. People need to assess what the, the issues are. But if we do go down a, a hard Brexit and we're not in the single market, which I think will be devastating both for our economy as well as for the environment, as I hope I think I've, I've made clear, there will be big issues for the rest of Europe. Um, I mean, in terms of the shared resources we have, you know, I mentioned air and, and, uh, and, and fisheries, but, you know, the, the, if we, even if we bring the, the birds directive across, which one would hope we would, you know, birds are migratory species and they don't just stop when they get to the channel. And so there are, there are big issues about what a hard Brexit means for our European partners and how they take forward their environmental agendas as well. Thank you. Several, I'll, I'll come, don't worry, I'm, I'm coming over with plenty of time. I'm coming over here as well. Sally Holmes, Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management. And my question really follows on, uh, I think, quite nicely from, from Emma's. Um, there are a number of uh, environmental professional bodies and learning societies who are all doing lots of work around trying to realise some of the, the opportunities and minimise some of the risks around Brexit in relation to environmental legislation. And we're drawing on our members and our expert members to create evidence and, and ideas and policies um, that we think could help the government in terms of framing the future. The real opportunity there is for us all to work together collaboratively and speak with, if not one voice, but at least to share our expertise. We don't, uh, partly because we're all trying to vie with each other to get uh, the attention of the select committees, to get the attention of the civil servants who are advising our ministers. We could be, I think, driven more to work collaboratively by the government saying, we want you, we want you to speak with one voice, we want to hear the voice of the professionals, but you need to work together. But that, that doesn't, we never get that, we never get that message, we never get that sort of framework within which to operate. We're always trying to second guess what's going on and, and effectively almost competing with each other, and I think that's very negative. And how would you advise us to almost challenge the government to say we will listen to you but you need to work together to do so H how do we get the ear and the voice uh, the ear of government well if i was being unkind i would say it was in the government's interest given their position on a number of things to carry on with divide and rule 
um, and they have the stakeholders that they want to listen to already, um, if I was being unkind. So, but, but irrespective of that, I don't think you should be waiting for government to tell you what to do. I mean, I, I really think, and I, I can say this because I was a chief executive of the CPRE, so I, I was in that position where I had a, a, a conservation charity who, want, you know, we relied on membership money, and that meant you had to show your members you were doing something, which meant you had to keep bringing people up to the top of the hill, branded CPRE. Um, and yet the, the scale of the challenge that we now face with Brexit, I have to say, I think is so fundamental that we need to put that aside. And certainly one of the things that um, I've been quite heartened by um, is, um, and it's a small example to illustrate the point, you know, the Wildlife and Countryside Link is working for, for the first time actually with the animal welfare organisations as well to come up with a common position on where to go post-CAP because they recognise, and I'm sort of in the way that I think a number of us do, if we're going to get any slice of this cake of, uh, of the, the three billion, we have to show that the public buy into it and they accept that while people accept the environment's important, they love animals, they seriously love animals. Um, and therefore, the broader the coalitions you can get, I think we stand more chance. And I, I really genuinely feel the scale of the threat is so large. If institutions and charities can't put their personal issues aside on this, then we're all sunk. And there, you know, there just won't be any point saying that we care about the environment because we'll have missed what is, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's not just a once in a generation. I mean, it's almost a once in a hundred years threat. I, I, I would just point out, I mean, the State of Nature report, the two that have come out, is a classic example of how a whole bunch of, okay, in that case, biodiversity conservation organizations have pooled their own interests and work together. Quite how that happened, I'm actually not sure. Um, I think it's probably a question of somebody first amongst equals taking the lead and banging heads, but I don't know. Over there, and then I'm going to come back over here. The lady against the wall, right over there. Go on, run! <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Sarah Parkin. <coughs> I thought you didn't recognise me. I didn't, no, I, I didn't. Um, um, I'm <laughs> from the Sustainability Literacy Project, but I've got a, a sort of a suggestion, um, but first an observation. We have to remember that the Brexit vote was predicated on deep unhappiness about the way society and the economy was going. And in the United States, and increasingly here, there is the phrase, um, if you care for the environment... Um, that means you don't care about people. And we can only expect that to get worse. So that's the observation that we have to tie whatever we do to the well-being of society uh, and the economy on which people depend, depend, and that includes inequality. And I think that if... I'm going to self-criticise and criticise the... Sarah, this is a speech, not no, a, no, not but a question. But I, I've got a pretty... <laughs> well, a question, now, question, question. It, well, uh, just to point out that in 1996, there was an initiative called The Politics of the Real World, which was a collaboration between 33 NGOs across the environment, poverty, democratic spectrum... And that was so successful that John Major actually asked the Charity Commission to look into us. He was, they were so worried. Um, and then the Labour Party... Uh, Sarah, come just, on. Come uh, on. The, quest well, the question is coming, but it's Could really... Run, please get to it. But if we're going to collaborate, we have to have a model for collaboration. And the collaboration caused a shock in the government, but the part, the, all those NGOs split when Labour was elected, because they thought, therefore, they were home and dry. Well, they weren't. But I would suggest, and my question is, is that a model that is worth replicating? So we're actually aligning the well-being of the environment with society's concerns, with the economy and all the rest of it, and we do it in that sort of cross-disciplinary, if you like, uh, collaboration. So is that's, that that's, fine. that's okay. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> that could be a good model. I'd like to hear more about how it actually worked. As somebody, um, as John alluded to at the beginning, uh, the start of my 
career in charities, I was at the RSPCA for 10 years, and at the end I was seconded to run the campaign uh, against hunted animals. And it was a, a, co it was a coalition, because previously everyone had been fighting on their own corner, and the RSPCA had been doing it within charity boundaries, and the League Against Cruel Sports, which weren't a charity, were doing various um, uh, more uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, tactics, um, uh, but we weren't actually tackling some of the sort of social issues. And so, we, with a number of other farming organisations, we formed a coalition, uh, and we were addressing not just animal welfare issues, but issues around jobs in rural areas. So we addressed all the issues, and I think that was pretty fundamental in, in, in helping deliver the result that we got. So I'm absolutely behind all that, and it's why at the end of my talk I talked about. I think we can address the issues which aren't just about environment, but are about people's jobs. You know, we're not going to have jobs like we used to have 40 years ago in certain parts of our country because, we, you know, we need skilled labour now. But the green economy and the, the ability to find jobs in that area could be part of the answer. And equally, I, I'm really taken, and I've been chucking this idea out to anyone who will listen to me, um, is that, you know, the CAP issue, we ought to be arguing for a a natural health service, not because the Brexiteers were talking about money back for the National Health Service. Well, we want the money from CAP for a natural health service which delivers healthy food and a healthy environment which gives us the air and the, uh, um, uh, the water and the countryside that we need for our mental health. I think that idea's got some traction, so that's why I just keep punting it out to people. So I'm, I'm keen to work in coalitions, um, and I was very pleased during the referendum campaign to be uh, found a member of the Environmentalists for Europe, but that was just environmentalists. It's got to be across the spectrum. There was a gentleman here who had been putting his hand up quite a lot. This young man here. <coughs> Sorry? This lady's already got the mic. Really I didn't point to her. I pointed here. I'll go to you next, okay? You. Well, you, you take the mic and then we'll come here. Okay, you've got the mic. Off you go. Thank you. Uh, Evelyn Underwood from the Institute for European Environmental Policy. Um, you raised some interesting issues about how um, EU legislation would be translated. Would it be primary or secondary legislation? Also, um, for example, how we translate the cap. Um, I'm really interested to know, do you see any risks that environmental policy will become devolved to the four regions of the UK? Um, will this cause splits where we start having different standards in Scotland and in England? Where do you see the biggest problems? Thank you. It's a very, very pertinent question, um, and certainly, I mean, I've already had discussions with colleagues in Scotland and Wales about the common agricultural policy, and uh, if the Welsh and the, the Scottish governments decide to go for higher standards uh, to meet some of their other legislative um, frameworks. I mean, for example, in, in Wales, as you know, they've got, you know, the... Uh, the Future Wellbeing Act, which is already now really a fantastic piece of legislation, is now starting to bite local authorities and others having to take it, take it into account. Uh, and they've got that framework already. So how are they? You know, how can, in a sense, they bring f bring forward reduced environmental standards if they've got that piece of framework? But if if the UK government, on behalf of England, says, well, actually no, we want to go for down this deregulated route, we could really be facing some very significant issues which would not only be um, difficult to manage for our businesses but would also could also mean we could have very different environmental standards which in terms of enforcement would be hugely challenging so i think this is an issue that hasn't been looked at um, sufficiently uh, but it's something that we as a, a movement have got to get to grips with and we ought to be using the welsh and the scottish governments to help make our case thank you gentlemen young man here Hi, um, I'm Rick Parfitt from British Ecological Society. Um, thanks very much for the talk, I found it really interesting. In a year of post-truth politics, um, where people do not seem to have much respect for nuance or evidence, I guess I have two questions. One, do you think that's a continuing trend or a temporary lapse? And two, the British Ecological Association, like many of the associations here, has plenty of members who want to promote evidence-informed policy and work with policymakers. In the post-truth politics context, how is the best way of approaching that? Thank you. If I could answer that, I'd be a very rich person. <laughs> um, uh, do I think it's uh, a blip? No. Um, sadly, I don't think it's a, a blip, but I do see signs of hope. Um, 
And I certainly believe, I mean, one of the things that really annoyed me, I mean, and I've been in the House of Lords six years, so you know, lots of things have annoyed me. One thing that really annoyed me was when we tried to get an amendment to the EU referendum bill to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote, because it wasn't a general election, it was a once in a generation opportunity, because young people are concerned about their future. And I know from when I go to speak to six form colleges and schools to talk about the role of the House of Lords, just how and then I suddenly say something about the environment, how engaged younger people are with the issues. I mean, it's, it's been part of the geography curriculum, so they know about climate change, they know a bit about resource uses. There is, there is, there is a groundswell of um, concern which we need to nurture. It's not, you know, it's, it's not a given, we have to nurture it. But I think if we can, if we can look to the younger generation and we can and not get despondent, as it's all too easy to do at the moment, then that is, that is one thing. But the second thing is we are going to have to get much smarter about the language you use. I mean, I could have, like all of you, we could have talked about ecosystem services, um, about, you know, infrastructure and um, neonicotinoids. We need to talk about bees and health and clean water and going for a, a swim in the sea. We're not like that. I mean, we're we're quite techy and policy rich. Um, uh, if I was being unkind, we're a bit policy wonkish sometimes. And we've got to get much, much better at communicating what we believe in. Um, uh, and if I can just sort of extend your point a little bit, one of the things that does worry me about um, uh, where we are post-Brexit and post-Trump is what Trump means on the climate change agenda because he's rode back on so many other issues that he talks about during the election campaign, but he hasn't started rowing back on, on climate change. And if he starts a, um, a discussion and a debate about climate change with the success that he does have to articulate things, then that could be incredibly damaging. Uh, I'm Joanna Bagrewska. I'm a zoologist from the University of Reading. Uh, and I was wondering if uh, you might have any ideas on, I never thought I would say that, the silver lining of Brexit in the context of invasive species. Uh, so there's a lot of invasive species of plants and animals in uh, the UK, and because it's an island, it's such a delicate ecosystem. Do you think it could actually be a positive if, um, if there could be much stricter uh, policies on that topic. You keep all the foreigners out. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm one of them, so <laughs> I'll be the first one out. Sorry, that was flippant. But um, <laughs> On the other hand, uh, the lady here mentioned about uniting um, and doing something together. Uh, I'm also representing an organization called Science is Vital, and we are uh, collaborating with some MPs who have uh, managed to put uh, forward uh, an early day motion asking to commit for scientists to be able to have funding and potential for collaboration with European scientists, uh, regardless of what happens with Article 50. So if all of you could write to your MP... It sounds like a speech to me. Yes. <laughs> no, it sounds like a speech. Uh, well, that's it's basically question. it. <laughs> question, question. Um, the question was about the invasive okay, species. Thank you. But yes, um, science is vital, has a little template if you, if you want to do something for science in Britain. Thank you. I think it's very easy for people to say yes on invasive species. Yes, there could be an advantage if we could have tighter security, which at the moment we can't do because Europe doesn't allow us. I think that's a very um, easy answer and I don't think it's a fair answer. We know for a fact on a number of the um, invasive species that the government are tackling now that a lot of the research into how we tackle them is being done collectively across Europe in research institutes. And if we're going to solve invasive species, actually we need to work together. And whilst we might be able to maybe make gains in one or two areas, on a whole other range of uh, environmental protection and biodiversity issues, I mean, you, you can't apply the same... Um, uh, rules of uh, locking out foreign exports. I mean, it's been, we were looking at some very interesting research recently in the House of Lords, looking at how um, various spiders were, you know, not only 
uh, coming across the channel, but also they were coming in uh, in um, tires from trade. I mean, the, you know, the trouble is they're going to come. We're in a global world. Even if we manage to shut the door and uh, in, insist on tighter regulations for some things, these, if we've got problems around the world, they will get to us. They'll either come in in cargoes or they'll fly across the channel or they'll swim across the channel. And it, it's a very short-sighted view to think, oh, yeah, we can, you know, we can put up tighter barriers and that will help us because in the long term and in the bigger picture it won't. Right, I'll just take two more one here, gentleman there and then I'm going to have to call it a day um, Adam Dunnan Institution of Environmental Sciences um, given it, it looks increasingly likely that um, the terms of the Brexit negotiation will go in front of Parliament what, what do you see as the role of the Lords in there and, and, and is there an appetite amongst your, your, your fellow Lords and, and Baronesses to um, challenge what might come out of the Commons well I can't speak for the whole of the Lords I mean there's nearly 800 of us there's far too many of us um, I'm in favour of reform of the House of Lords always have been um, and always will be. Um, so I can't speak for all of them, but I'm the deputy leader of the Liberal Democrats. And we just have over 100, so I can speak for them. Whilst we have Liberal Democrats in the House of Lords, we take our role to scrutinise government legislation very seriously indeed. We think that is our job, to hold the government to account. Uh, and our position is, um, is very clear, that we, any legislation that comes forward, we will scrutinise. Uh, and our position on um, Article 50, if there was to be a, a bill, is that we would only support um, Article 50 being triggered if there was a clear opportunity for the general public to have a say on the final terms of the deal. We accept the result of the first referendum that people have voted out, but they don't know what they voted out means. And in a democracy, and in a mature democracy that we have, people should know what that means, and therefore well, that, that is our position. But our, knowing colleagues across the House, um, one, of the, one of the lovely things about the House of Lords, which I wouldn't want to see change, is there's a great spirit of cross-party cooperation, is there is a, a large number of people who have, over the years, during their lifetimes, some of them obviously in their 80s and 90s, have seen the benefits of Europe, both in terms of its contribution to peace, to security and stability, um, uh, the building up our economy and the environment. And they are very mindful of what leaving Europe will mean. And so I have no doubt that we are going to have some extremely feisty debates in the House of Lords. There's, um, since, since I've been there in the six years, we, one time we did have debates through the night and they brought in camp beds for the lords and the baronesses. And I have every expectation that those camp beds will be found and brought out again. <laughs> right, one last question here. Hi, I'm Duncan Title from the Campaign to Protect Rural England. Um, my question was, you mentioned the need to kind of make the emotional arguments about the environment, etc. I was wondering how helpful you thought of uh, the kind of economic framing and natural capital. Is that, is that going to be stifling or helpful? Can they work together? I'm a big fan of the Natural Capital Committee, um, and I spent a lot of time persuading my party to argue it for it to be put on a, a permanent footing, um, and we went into the general election on that front. And I think that's really helpful in government. I think having those arguments about um, the, the value of the environment in a language which is understood by the Treasury and others works. Now, I accept it's not the whole picture. Um, but in lobbying terms in government, that is important. But in terms of the public message, that is a complete turn-off. And we have to have a, a, a true twin-track approach. In government, we have to accept that uh, the, the Green Book is in, all important in Treasury. And therefore, I think it's really great that the NCC, I think they've said by 2020, they'll actually have come up with an accounting mechanism, which is brilliant. But for the general public, if you start talking about that... It's not going to work, and we need to talk about how a strong environment is going to stop you being flooded, how you can have clean water, and those sort of things. So yes, it's important, and I, um, I would be the first to argue for that committee to take on a more prominent role, but it has to be separate from a public campaign.
Okay, well, thank you very much for those questions. I'm, I know that some of you still want to ask questions, but we really do need to begin to draw this to a close. So thank you for those questions. And before I finally close, can we just thank, okay, once more for an, a really, really beautiful exposition of a very, very complex issue. Thank you.